So remember, everything moves on helical angles. So, so the elbow joint moves on a helical angle. So triceps is a twister. Good morning. Happy Monday. I have neuro coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. Coming off a solid weekend. Um, digging right into the week. Uh, quick housekeeping. IFES University members, we have a Q&A at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today. 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today. If you're not a member of IFES University, you can go to ifsuniversity.com. Get yourself signed up so you can participate in today's Q&A. Okay. Um, so had like this perfect storm of uh, Q&As coming through. Ask Bill Hartman at gmail.com. And then had an incident um, not an incident per se, but but something happened that kind of pointed us in a direction that we're going to apparently talk about elbows this morning. Um, so two questions in the Q&A were about elbows. And then I did a parking lot diagnosis on the way out of the office last week um, with one of our pitchers. Um, and then uh, had Eric work a little bit of his juju in the gym. And we got a great report on our pitcher that uh, for the first time in three to four starts, he had no elbow pain. So this is kind of cool. So like I said, everything's just kind of pointing towards this elbow thing. I thought I would uh, sort of do this from the perspective of let's look at some common errors that people make generally. And then I'm gonna show you a video, I think from December, where we talked about some, some lateral elbow pain. I think one of the more common things is looking at elbows differently as if they're something special or unique, and they are not. Um, they have the, the, the same representations that the rest of your body has. Um, so when we look at these things, let's have the perspective that, that they're no different. We have to start with an archetype representation because that's gonna give us our initial starting conditions. Always remember that. And so if I have a wide ISA, I have somebody that's biased towards an IR representation. If I have somebody that's a narrow ISA, I have somebody that's biased towards an ER representation. So regardless of what I determine at the elbow, I have to understand where this person came from because that's gonna determine my initial interventions to restore relative motions as needed proximally first before I try to go after this, this elbow thing. Um, so I have to understand, do I have a relative motion issue at the shoulder? Do I have an orientation issue at this shoulder first and foremost? Then as you slide down to the elbow and you start to look at the elbow, we wanna look at elbow range of, range of motion. Um, let's get concepts of, of hyperextension and valgus out of our heads. They don't exist. Those, those planes are imaginary. Um, they are for discussion purposes only. They are not representations of movement. Elbow moves on helical angles just like everything else does. So what you're looking at are twists. So we need to be able to identify those twists. So don't look at these things as straight plane representations. One of the simplest tests that you're, you can do is, is clean elbow flexion extension. And, and we have to understand what those representations look like. And in the video that I'm gonna show you, there's a little bit of a representation as to how this flexion limitation represents itself and then what to do with that. Um, don't forget, hand position is just as important to help us determine this, this elbow representation. So I got my little apple test and I got my, my pistol test to help me determine where my hand position is relative to this distal forearm because if I can identify that, then I get a lot more information about what's going on in the elbow and I know how to position my hand, whether I need to use a supinated E-yard hand or do I need a pronated I-yard hand um, to help me re restore my ability to capture relative motions at the elbow. Um, also remember, range of motion is systemic, okay? It's not in, in isolation. Nothing happens in isolation. So I have checks and balances throughout the system. So I have ipsilateral hip to help me determine my, my shoulder representation. I have um, orientations of the pelvis that are gonna help me determine what the orientation of the thorax will be. So don't ignore those things. Remember, range of motion is systemic. So hopefully that guides you a little bit in regards to some of the things that, that, that people um, make mistakes with when it comes to elbows. Um, if you have a question or want to participate in a 15-minute consultation, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com, and we will set that up at our mutual convenience. I'll see you guys at the uh, IFAS University uh, members Q&A this afternoon. Everybody have an outstanding Monday, and here's a little video about lateral elbow pain. Q&A, and it is from jared 2 rs one o. Jared says, hi, Bill. Hi, Jared. Uh, thanks for all the information you post. Most welcome. 
Um, I saw the video you posted about wrist positions and was wondering if you have any solutions for something like tennis elbow. It seems like elbow position would be something to be concerned about asking for a friend. Well, Jared, let's see if we can help your friend a little bit. Um, the first thing that we want to we want to ask um, we're talking about lateral elbow pain so that unfortunately it gets branded as, as tennis elbow for some reason not really sure where that came from other than the fact that tennis players do experience this um, but anybody can um, you'll see it in the weight room quite a bit as well but ultimately what we're dealing with is a situation where we have too much pressure or tension in one place and then that's going to result in in a pain experience so it is an elbow result it's typically not an elbow problem although you can identify changes there that that um, sort of take the blame a lot of times for for why we do have pain but we want to think about orientation of the elbow um, as as a possible um, influencer and then as also as a possible solution. So we think like, okay, shoulder bones connected to the arm bone, arm bones connected to the elbow bone kind of a thing, but all of that is attached to the axial skeleton as well. And so we wanna make sure that we have full adaptability through the axial skeleton, then we have full adaptability at the shoulder, elbow, hand, wrist, etc. And so if we don't have that full adaptability proximally, then we're gonna to have to create some sort of compensatory strategy distally. Now, let's talk about this, this elbow a little bit, a little bit more specifically um, as far as why we might see this, this lateral elbow situation. So if we think about any activity, any activity that's gonna drive shoulder external rotation and elbow extension at the same time. So I think one of the reasons why we can brand this as a tennis elbow thing is because if you're hitting a backhand, I need a pretty strong elbow extension and I'm driving shoulder external rotation at the same time. Now, a little thing to remember about triceps. So triceps um, is branded as this elbow extender, which it is technically speaking, but it's a twister. So remember, everything moves on helical angles. So, so the elbow joint moves on a helical angle. So triceps is a twister. So the cool thing about triceps is that it can actually assist with that shoulder external rotation. So if I'm driving anything with a strong shoulder external rotation and elbow extension at the same time, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a medial, uh, posterior medial compressive strategy above the elbow. So think about all the fibers uh, that, that are medial um, to, that, to the line of the humerus, that would be triceps compressing um, that space. Now, if that happens, that creates external rotation in the shoulder, which is really, really nice and handy. But, but the big problem that we end up with is that we um, have a, a situation where the lateral aspect of triceps is now eccentrically oriented. So if we looked at the elbow capsule, we get a compression on that, that posterior medial aspect of the capsule. We'll get an expansion on the posterior lateral aspect. And now I don't have a really good elbow extension mechanism. Um, like I normally would if both aspects of the triceps were intact. And so now I have a substitution problem. So anything that can potentially extend the elbow is gonna try to help along. So now I got Ancona, it's a tiny little thing that's gonna try to extend the elbow. Supineer is gonna try to extend the elbow. Anything that's attached to the common extensor tendon is gonna try to extend the elbow. And so now I have muscles that were not well designed to produce this force, trying to produce this force. And so I get a lot of pressure and tension at the lateral elbow. And so, um, what I want to do is I want to show you a way to test this, um, which is kind of counterintuitive. We're actually going to use elbow flexion as, as our assessment, because if you think about if I create a, a, uh, a posterior medial compression on the, the inside of the elbow, I'm also going to then have a resultant expansion on the anterior medial aspect of the elbow. And so what happens is as I try to flex the elbow, because of the, the medial aspect being full of fluid, I can't compress there. So as I, as I flex my elbow to end range, I'm gonna do it in a slightly pronated position. So the test that I'm looking for here is supinated elbow flexion with full compression at end range. And so I took Eric into the purple room because I, I kind of figured that, that he would have a little bit of a deficit that we could actually show you in real time. So we'll, sh we'll show you the change. So the first thing I did is I, I put him up on the table there and we flex the elbow fully in a supinated position. You can kind of see where the end range stops. But then I took him out of supination. I put him in a little bit of pronation. You can see I can compress the elbow more fully. Now we're gonna go over to the left side as a comparison. And right away we see that we do have this fully 
fully compressible supinated elbow flexion as, as our comparison. So basically um, Eric is showing us this, this elbow orientation that we're talking about. So here's the fix, if you will. What we're gonna do is we're gonna drive extra rotation through the entire system on that, that right side. So we're gonna start, we're gonna do a, a dumbbell curl. We're gonna cheat the hand over to the inside edge of the dumbbell. That's gonna promote supination right away. Now Eric is pressing his thumb on, onto the inside of that dumbbell. And so that is ER of the hand. So we're driving extra rotation from the hand up. Then if you look at this body orientation, we have the, the thorax, the shoulder, the humerus and everything is ER as he does this this dumbbell curl and so it's really really simple we're just driving extra rotation through the entire system and what we're going to get is we're going to get a, a reduction of that concentric orientation of the medial aspect of triceps we're going to we're going to restore the orientation of the elbow and now when we put eric back up on the table and we check our supinated elbow flexion now we get this fully compressed look and so again, it's just a matter of understanding the orientation at the elbow. And now what we should have then is a normal extensor mechanism on the back side of that elbow. So we don't have to substitute with our tiny little muscles like Anconia supinator and, and the uh, common extensor compartment. And so hopefully, Jared, that gives you an idea of what you're looking at with this lateral elbow stuff and provides you a little bit of a solution. Keep in mind, it is a solution. It's not the solution. There are other things that can be going on, but this is a really, really common one. So so, so I hope it's useful.